Good afternoon, this is John Shaw, Director of the Paul Simon Public Policy Institute at Southern Illinois University in Carbondale. Thanks for joining another edition of our series, Understanding Our New World. And we're really, really delighted today to be joined by a native of Southern Illinois, Melinda Hennenberger. Uh, Melinda is one of the most interesting, respected, tenacious, fearless journalists in the country and is just uh, a really amazing resource for the, for the whole United States. She grew up in Mount Carmel, so nearby here, went to Notre Dame University. Uh, she went to graduate school in Belgium, Catholic University in Louvain, which is outside of Brussels. Had an amazing career in journalism, the Dallas Morning News, um, Newsday in New York, New York Times, Washington Post. She was editor-in-chief of Roll Call, which is a Capitol Hill publication. She's written for Bloomberg Politics. Um, received all sorts of awards and in the last three years has been a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize for her writing uh, for the Kansas City Star. Um, she actually has just finished up a five-year stint there where she was vice president and head of editorial. Uh, as I said, was a Pulitzer nom nominee three times, did some really remarkable writing on crime, criminal justice, schools, state and local politics. Um, and we're particularly indebted to her because she's literally now moving. She's on her way to Sacramento where she's taking up a new position at the Sacramento Bee. So she's actually joining us from Denver, Colorado uh, after a day or so on the road. So Melinda, thanks so much. Great to see you. Thank you so much, John. It's great to be here. Well, actually, after all I, the wind in Western Kansas yesterday, it's great to be anywhere, but <laughs> I'm very happy to be here safe in Denver with friends. Great, great. Well, Melinda, let's start out with growing up in Mount Carmel. I, your dad was a banker. Your mom owned an antique and a gift shop. Tell us about growing up in Mount Carmel. I loved growing up in Mount Carmel. Maybe everybody feels that. Maybe everybody doesn't feel that way about their hometown. But, um, you know, terrific friends, small town. The first time I brought my uh, now husband back to, to visit Mount Carmel over Christmas time. We went on an errand uptown, as we call it, right? And we were just going to run into a store and grab something. And it took us an hour before um, before we could just do this little errand because we ran into so many people. And my husband said, oh, my God, I, I feel like I'm in It's a Wonderful Life. This is this Bedford Falls you grew up in, you know, and it really was a very vibrant town, um, has lost a lot of jobs in recent years, which is a very sad thing to see. But it was a fantastic place to grow up. And were you sort of, I mean, it's very close to the Indiana border. So were yeah. you spending time in Indiana as well as Illinois? Did you get occasional trips to Carbondale or? Yes, occasional trips to Carbondale. The hilarious thing about growing up on a border like that, I mean, we were literally one mile from Indiana, right across the Wabash River. And we thought that, oh, those people in Indiana are totally different from us. <laughs> so... You know, narcissism of small differences, or in this case, no differences. <laughs> so, well, tell us yeah. about your decision to go to Notre Dame, uh, you know, what you studied there, and then from, you know, no, uh, Notre Dame to Louvain, how, how those two. So I always wanted to go into journalism from the time I, I mean, obviously, I don't remember this, but I apparently started telling my family that's what I was going to do from the time I was about three years old. And I don't know why that is, but it's really the only thing I ever wanted to do. So I um, went to Notre Dame probably because, uh, well, my dad went there. My uncles went there. All the women in the family had gone to St. Mary's. Um, and, you know, back then where you went to college wasn't you didn't visit 20 schools and then and spend months getting ready. And um, yeah, I, I my school counselor tried to convince me that there was no such thing as the SAT because <laughs> Illinois is an ACT state. And I kept saying, I see this thing where Notre Dame wants me to take something called the SAT. So it was um, it was a one night application process. And I was thrilled to, to go to Notre Dame, uh, though they did not have a journalism program at that time. So I had a double major in American studies, uh, which 
was interdisciplinary history, government, uh, communications, and uh, modern languages was my other major. But uh, I, I enjoyed it very much. It's wonderful. And then, well, and how did Louvain happen? Had you, was this like, had you, uh, did they have a, a junior year abroad that caught your interest? Or how did you happen to decide to go there after Notre Dame? The truth is, since I only wanted to go into journalism and my folks had kind of convinced me that that was probably not going to happen because we didn't know anybody in journalism. We didn't, um, you know, have any of those kind of connections or, you know, really even know that much about what it would take to get a job like that. So, um, after school, I did a volunteer year, Catholic volunteer year, um, very much like a Jesuit volunteer corps, but it was called Holy Cross Associates uh, in California. And I was so happy that I got this fellowship to study in Belgium. It's a great experience, but also in part because I really didn't know what I was going to do since I believed that the thing I really wanted to do was probably not, I had been convinced that it was probably not going to be possible for me, but you know, things happened as they should have. I mean, I, I did my year in Belgium, then just as you did, I did an internship at what we then called the common market, the European commission. I worked in the press office Got to know a bunch of journalism, a bunch of journalists, and that's really how I got in into the field. And then your first big job in the U.S. was with the Dallas Paper, is that right? And I think I understood you to yes. say you were kind of did they you started out on the police beat? Was that just sort of yes. a customary way of bringing people in? Yes. I started out covering night cop, so I worked from four p.m. to one a.m. Again, a fantastic. Uh, entree into journalism. I mean, I, I really loved that beat. And in those days, you had so much more access to officials at every level. I mean, we worked out of the police headquarters and just wandered around at will and could ask anyone anything and could see all of the reports. Um, so it was it was a rich uh, environment to cover. Yeah. Well, and, and Melinda, when I look at just, I mean, the, the organizations you've worked for, I mean, it's just, you know, it's almost this, you know, the, you know, this amazing array, you know, uh, the Dallas paper, Newsday, New York Times, Washington Post, etc. Was there, and, and you've done very different things too, reporting, yeah. editing, uh, management, etc. Was there a, a grand strategy or was Aww. it just literally <laughs> opportunity kind of presenting itself and going for it and then just sort of riding the tide? There was definitely no grand strategy. And I would say that it's really now that I'm getting to do exactly what I always wanted to do, because I really got in this, as most of us did, to write about injustice, to write about the powerless. Um, and it's really now that I have the freedom to do what I always wanted to do. So the, I would say the last five years have been the best of my career by a long shot and have been the most satisfying for sure. Well, when I was thinking about this interview I, over the weekend, I was I was browsing through a book I have at home called Letters to a Young Journalist, which uh, Samuel Friedman wrote. And he, 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 there's a sentence or two that I read and I was thinking, this sort of reminds me of Melinda. And he wrote, uh, if you give me a choice, I will always prefer to write about someone obscure rather than someone famous. And as much as I savor the company of fellow journalists at a party or in a newsroom, I feel like I've done something wrong if I bump into any of them reporting the same story as I am. That is really why I have loved the last five years so much in Kansas City, because I could spend the rest of my life in D.C., and I would never have a story all to myself. Of course, you always try to do your, the best possible job, but there are always dozens, if not more, uh, people covering any story you would, you would cover pretty much. And in Kansas City, it's really not been like that. There are, um, there are just, 
issues that and stories that just wouldn't be covered if you didn't do it. That's not true only for me, but I think that's true for a lot of us. And how satisfying is that, right? Um, and I so agree on how much more satisfying it is to bring light to a situation rather than to, to write more about people who've already, if anything, been overcovered. Yeah. I came across in that same book, uh, the Nicholas Lehman quote that I had seen before, but I had re he reminded me of it. And in which Lehman, he was a, a journalist who became a dean of a journalist, right. said, it often seems to me that at any given moment, 99% of the journalists are covering 1% of what's happening in the world. I know in my own experience as a DC reporter, um, you know, covering Capitol Hill, uh, you know, whatever the story of the day was, there were just, you know, dozens of reporters, you know, covering it. And I, I had thoughts like, man, is this the best way to use our time and energy and resources? Especially resources is the key word, especially at a time when there are so many fewer resources in the business. I think it's fantastic to be in local. It's a great time to be in local news because it's never been more necessary that we do this work. And there really are many fewer people doing it. I saw a story recently that isn't really surprising, but I, I hadn't heard this fact that journalism has lost more workers than the coal mining industry since the year 2000. Wow. Yeah. Well, I want to come back to the Kansas City Star in just a second, but before I do, I want to, I, I read, happened to read some of your uh, some of your articles when you were in Rome, you were the New York Times oh, okay. Rome bureau chief. And I came across some articles you wrote in 2002 um, uh, covering the, 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 the clergy abuse scandal was just exploding across the country, uh, across the world, actually. And but there was a couple of press conferences that the American cardinals had in Rome. And your articles were so wonderful because it kind of reminded me how sometimes by just letting people talk and and reporting their words you don't really need to say a whole lot more i mean whether it's by what they say or just their evasions and i i just wanted one of them was a, a great moment where cardinal law from boston was kind of at the mm -hmm. epicenter of this crisis and um there was a big discussion about whether he's going to be forced to resign or the, the, the american cardinals would pressure him and then you quote Cardinal McCarrick from DC say, we've passed that point in the discussions. The time for that would have been at the beginning. We're over that. As if, you know, it just, cause they, the moment in the, in the internal conversation passed, the issue was taken care of. That was a issue for me to cover as a Catholic. It was very discouraging. Um, as a journalist, it was super interesting and as a Catholic hard. And one of the hardest things was years later when we learned that this same then Cardinal Ted McCarrick, um, who seemed to so many of us at the time to get it and to realize that the church had to change, uh, could not have been um, more criminally involved himself. Yeah. Right. So, and there was another. Another piece where you uh, there had been like this uh, a, a press conference scheduled had been delayed for two and a half hours or so, and then when they came out, they released this very very terse bare bones statement and went you know press to explain why it took them two and a half hours to r say nothing. Uh, it was I think it was Bishop Gregory who said bishops like to wordsmith. There is a desire to say things carefully. <laughs> Yeah. And I knew of Bishop uh, Gregory because he had been the Bishop of Belleville, which was my diocese growing up in Southern Illinois, you know, though Belleville is obviously on the other side of the state from where I was. Um, so, yeah. Well, I mean, two of the people that you covered up close was, um, you know, Pope John Paul II. It was in the latter years of his papacy. And also Cardinal Ratzinger, who was then a senior Vatican official who became uh, Pope Benedict. Uh, right. You won't linger on famous people, but could you say a little bit about covering John Paul II near the end of his life and then also Ratzinger as um, a prominent uh, uh, Vatican official? 
I'm really sorry that I covered John Paul at the end of his papacy because he was so compromised at that time, right? I mean, I don't really think, and I wrote this, that he was running the Vatican at all. I think, I mean, he could not communicate, and I'm not sure it was not John Paul. And, uh, you know, a lot of people think it, it was his secretary of state and some of his aides, but he would have his, you know, his biographer and, and some others who wanted to give the misimpression that he was a lot, um, a lot more vigorous than was the case. They'd say, oh, at dinner last night, he had us all in stitches, so funny, so on top of everything, you know, and uh, obviously none of this was true because by that point, I mean, the thing he did that, that was beautiful was um, teach people how to die. I mean, he, I think, gave great witness on that front on, um, on suffering, on um, not hiding himself away, on being more himself. He was more upfront than any other Pope had been about, about getting sick. Um, uh, even though his his supporters were not as forthcoming. So um, as for Benedict, I mean, he had a greater impact on the final years of John Paul's papacy, you know, through his work um, as the, uh, the, the Pope's theologian, you know, and he really is a theologian. And so um, was not the care everybody knows this was not the charismatic figure that John Paul was I think he did a beautiful thing by stepping down which of course hadn't happened in many centuries the thing that's so disappointing obviously for both of them um, though is the fact that they both did for a long 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 time um, for an unforgivably long time to me turn a blind eye to abuse. And so, you know, the defenders of John Paul will say, well, you know, in Poland, where he grew up, if a communist official wanted to silence a priest, he would make an allegation of that kind that this was an abuser. And so they would say that for that reason, John Paul never credited these allegations. But when you see the, uh, the, the detail of the allegations, the number of the allegations over years and years and years, it's pretty, it's pretty hard to say that he did not know what was going on. Right. So, yeah. Melinda, let's talk about uh, your work in Kansas City. And first of all, let's tell us, I mean, talk a little bit about you moving to Kansas City. You'd been in D.C. for 20 years. When you moved to town, how do you go about um, insinuating yourself into a community <laughs> and begin to sort of feel like you know enough to start digging in and, and, uh, and writing amazing columns? How did you start? Well, when I first started, I mean, I ended up writing a very different kind of column than I began with, right? Obviously, because um, you never want to pretend to know more than you know. That's the worst thing you can do. So in the beginning, I covered a lot. I uh, It was more observational. It was since I didn't know a lot of people, I would go cover a hearing, a trial, a hearing. I would go tr uh, cover a Lincoln Day dinner. I would, I would cover a lot, write columns off events. And that way I got to know people and to know what was going on. And it was a, a great entree. Uh, after, you know, as time went on, I would say I did more, I definitely concentrated mostly on the criminal justice system in the final years there and on really injustices that had been done, especially in Kansas City, Kansas. Right. Well, Melinda, I, I want to go through just a couple of the articles that really, really uh, I found powerful. I mean, you know, as you say, you, you delved into the criminal justice system and, and much of that you found was infuriating, um, 
heartbreaking, you know, just powerful beyond belief. There was a woman that you write about, Tabitha Birdsong, who right. um, had been um, effectively harassed, pursued for almost a decade by her estranged husband. She called the police repeatedly three or four times a week. Um, mm -hmm. They, you know, modestly responded. Ultimately, he killed her. And then in your your column, I mean, you trace her life, but then you, you talk to an inspector and said, you know, uh, I think it was D Detective Risen saying, you know, couldn't you have done more? And his kind of response was, well, victims need to protect themselves. I mean, you talk about that, that. killed me, him saying victims need. This is the guy who took calls from her three, four times a week. She was absolutely doing everything. After she died, I saw these detailed notebooks she kept about every contact. And she was trying to do everything. She did everything right. She tried so hard. She would, she would leave and go to different states and he would find her and she I can't see what more she possibly could have done so it said something not just about this guy but about the system and about our attitudes to say well you know victims uh, in the end are responsible for their own safety you know you, you gotta they have to do something to help themselves and you concluded the article by saying, uh, or not didn't conclude it, but you, 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 you had this passage, domestic abuse isn't just a crime against one person, but can terrorize everyone in that person's world. And your article gave just a really profound sense of just how the people who were in her orbit, you know, were also terrorized by this guy. And uh, that case still has not gone to trial. And her family is still reeling from all of that drama, of course, and it's still rippling through her community. So, so yeah, it it is a a lot deeper than we always than we think. Well, a, 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 a more uplifting story was a woman by the name of Nastasia Hodge who had oh, been released. Right. Uh, for, she had spent 13 years in prison. She was uh, convicted or she confessed to killing the person who had been pursuing her. Abuser, her abuser, right? Her yeah. abuser. And, but so she spent 13 years in prison, then is discharged and is determined to have a new life. She moves, I think, to Abilene and, yeah. and, um, and just assembles a really, really uh, nice life. And I know you, you maybe were in touch with her even when she was in prison. Um, but she said something, or you quoted her saying something that just kind of blew me away. She said, I'm not going to let all the time that I spent in prison be in vain as she launched her new life. Talk about her. I just talked to Natasha yesterday on my way here on my drive, um, and I talked to her a lot. She's a fantastic person. She's someone who really never had a life, really had been abused as a kid, in fleeing that abuse, she, you know, went on, ended up on the street, as so often happens. I mean, most of the people who end up in the situation she ended up in were fleeing abuse to begin with. That's a very common scenario. So she ends up working as a prostitute and uh, involved with a, a crack um, addict um, who she um, eventually killed and believed that, you know, based on the number of times he had attacked her, that she would have been killed if she didn't do that. But so she finally gets out and the stuff she was doing when she first got out, I went to her apartment the first week she was out in Abilene. First of all, it's so brave that she moved to Abilene rather than back to Kansas City, Kansas, where there would have been a lot more um temptation or not even temptation but it would have been so easy for her to you know to get back into being around people who were not good for her so she decided to go to work for this candy factory that had been her prison job russell stover in abilene where she knew nobody she did not know how to drive she got a used car learned to drive to get herself around. And she said, I feel like a toddler out here. You know, she's learning to do all these things. One of her first 
preoccupations was, oh gosh, I got to get my taxes filed because they tell me I owe taxes. I'm like, oh my gosh, you just got out of prison and you want to, you know, she wanted to have a root canal and pay her taxes. I'm like, boy, Natasha, you really know how to have fun. <laughs> um, but uh, she is an amazing, strong woman. And I'm so glad to see her um, building the kind of life that she always deserved. Yeah. And you write it for you said, in a better world, she could have done anything. And I mean it. You you write also um, about um, a wonderful article about teachers. And I think it was in the context of a, a, a bill that was being debated in Kansas, a so-called Parents' Bill of Rights. Um, so you profile four teachers who are just doing remarkable things. So in the inspirational, face of just, all these people, right just amazing but the the one that i really liked it was a, a young woman by the name of kawana Ford johnson everyone called her miss c and i want to read a couple sentences that you quote and just maybe have you go say some more she said everyone's safe around me i'm just going to teach your kids persistence and hard work and overcoming whatever it is that life throws at you and making the most of it I won't stop what I do, and I'm not afraid to speak out because my intentions are pure. I always wanted to be in this career, and I'm going to go. I'm going and I'm going to roll with it. Tell us about Miss C. What a great role model for these kids of any for all of all of her students. I mean, so she uh, is someone who was in a very serious traffic accident. I think near the end of her junior year in high school you know, was not even supposed to walk again. Uh, so appreciates uh, everything in her life, you know, after she, through very hard work, was was able to do all these things she was told she would never be able to do. She's an African-American, like, in her late 20s, who's a first-year teacher and experiencing some skepticism from parents who are afraid she's going to be teaching CRT and she's and it was in response to that that she said I'm just going to teach your kids how to persevere well and I you, you talk about this whole the, 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 we'll, we'll call it a discussion of uh, critical race theory CRT but I loved your 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 comment you say when people talk about critical race theory which is not being taught in Kansas schools what they're really talking about is not wanting their children to hear a version of American history that includes race. And that is kind of like leaving war out of a history of the Roman Empire. Right. <laughs> right. I mean, I heard the Rosie, ver I was taught the Rosie, the, the all perfect version of American history. And what good does that do? I mean, that's not actually history. That's as we, we wish things had been. I mean, I have heard a lot of people in Germany saying, learning about the Holocaust doesn't make us hate ourselves. Learning about the Holocaust is crucial. And I think it's the same for us and learning about slavery, Jim Crow, everything that came since then. It doesn't weaken us, it strengthens us. Well, another character that uh, I liked was a, a cheerleader uh, by the name of Lacey okay. Kuyper, who was at uh, Truman High School in Independence. Um, so she's 18 years old. She's in a wheelchair. She has a disease which forces her bones to break uh, easily. So she's in a wheelchair, excited beyond words to be part of the cheerleading team. And then the teachers and the staff and the parents just marginalize her and exclude her from things. Um, she struggles and she ponders quitting and just moving on. But then she says this to you. She said, that's when I decided, no, I'm not quitting. I've got to fight here because I want it to be known that you can't treat people, treat people like this. This ends here. Tell us about Lacey. Lacey is fantastic. How brave. And her folks too, right? Her, her mom is deceased and her dad, so she had been raised mostly by her grandmother. So her dad has, uh, she's only been living with her dad and stepmom for a couple of years. What it takes for them to do everything they do, to have to think, well, how am I gonna get all this equipment? You know, it, it's even transportation is a huge 
uh, challenge. And they have, their family has felt so unsupported and also so much pride in Lacey for saying, you know, no, I will not be treated like this. And I don't want to see anybody else treated like this. And it's, it's so inspiring and so important that she spoke up for herself. I mean, I put it in the paper, but she's the one who was strong enough to speak up for herself. Right. Well, another inspiring person was Sister Jeannie Christensen. Right. Who was the last member of the Sister of Mercies in Kansas City. Um, after 134 years, the order, I guess, dwindled down to her. So she left and moved to Omaha. But, you know, in the course of her, her, her ministry, uh, she worked on affordable housing, social justice issues, uh, worked against human trafficking, combated clerical abuse, just this amazing life. And you say uh, uh, of her, you say, there is always, and I say this with admiration, been a little bit of outlaw in the Sister of Mercies, uh, Sisters of Mercy. Without that, they would have never shown up here in the first place. Talk about this sister and then the work of this order uh, in Kansas City. She is still involved in her work in Omaha and fighting human trafficking. Um, but she said, you know, I didn't join a community to be here by myself. So I very much understand why she wanted to go back to Omaha. But what she accomplished, what, it, what one woman can and did accomplish was really something. And her, one of her last acts in Kansas City, she and a friend reclaimed an old statue of the Virgin Mary from their original convent in Kansas City and put it in the VW. And she says, it's on my balcony now in Omaha. <laughs> so they rescued Mary. <laughs> Great. Well, I, I would actually encourage our, our, our listeners to, to just go online and read some of, of Melinda's articles because they do show, I mean, I think, you know, suffering and sadness and disappointment and injustice, but also some of the kind of the small triumphs or not small triumphs of, of normal people. Um, as they go through life. Um, really great reading. Well, Melinda, let's broaden this out to talk a little bit about the news business. And particularly, um, you know, you've been in the newspaper business for most of your career. And as much has been written about the pressures on the newspaper industry, the, the, the fact that something like 1,300 communities have lost papers. Um, talk about the bigger picture of, of, of the role of newspapers and the pressures on them. Well, local news has never, as I said before, been more important. I mean, where there are news deserts, bad things happen. Where there's no accountability, um, you know, it's the golden age of corruption. What's, I think, most demoralizing for people in my business is not even the new pressures and it's not how understaffed we are and that we're expected to do more, all of that we're willing to do. The hard part is really um, to hear that what we write um, isn't true and that facts don't matter, facts are whatever you say they are, that in, it's, it's really hearing from people who are smart and well-intentioned that they don't believe you because a different kind of news source, or I shouldn't even say news source, a different outlet has told them that they can believe what they want to believe. And that's, that's the truth. And that is the challenge of our time. I mean, more so than the money. Yes, the, the business model is broken and we don't know how to fix it. That's the truth so far. But the, to me, the bigger challenge even than that is the whole um, misinformation, disinformation, fake news, the decades that have been spent convincing people that we're not in this for the right reasons, that we're um, instruments of, of fake news. Right. That's the hard part. And I'm gonna, I, I the only thing we can do about that is to keep working hard and doing what we're doing. 
And there are, of course, also many people who appreciate what we do. I mean, leaving the star, I've gotten so many amazing, kind, uh, supportive letters from readers. It's really been something. Right. I want to read kind of a broader comment, and then I want, I want, I'm going to come back to the uh, disinformation uh, because we actually got a, 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 a question about that. But I was reading an essay in The Atlantic, um, and it was about an, a small town in Iowa, a, a medium-sized town, Burlington, that was losing its newspaper, or it was it was under serious pressure. And I want to read a couple sentences to just maybe kind of get at the, at the power and the importance of, of, of news in, in small towns. And, and the author writes, when people lament the decline of small newspapers, they tend to emphasize the important stories that will go uncovered. Political corruption, school board scandals, zoning board hearings, policemen, misconduct. They are right to worry about that. But often overlooked are the more quotidian stories, the ones that disappear first when a paper loses resources. Stories about the annual teddy bear picnic at Crapo Park, the town hall meeting, about the new swimming pool design and the tractor games during Denmark Heritage Days. These stories are the connective tissue of a community. They introduce people to their neighbors and they encourage readers to listen and empathize with one another. When that tissue dis disintegrates, something vital rots away. We don't often stop to ponder the way that a newspaper's collapse makes people feel less connected, more alone. As local news crumbles, so does our tether to each other. Talk about that and maybe even just uh, from your, your experience in Kansas City, obviously it's not a small town, but just the importance that that newspaper pay, plays in keeping that community um, a special, vibrant place. It's absolutely vital, but it's also true that only, uh, you know, one side of the political spectrum tends to see that right now. I mean, I also get a, an awful lot of mail from the kind of person who thinks, who has been convinced that um, nobody in the media is to be trusted unless it's uh, Fox News or similar. Um, so it's it's really sad to see that breakdown. That's, that's very true that um, even in a, like in the small town where I grew up, there are more political divisions now than used to be the case. I mean, uh, of course it is because it's part of the world and the world is more polarized now. And, um, you know, no place is immune from that. But people don't, oh, like, I, I forget what it even was. I was hoping that some organization I was in touch with their democratic organization could reach out to their Republican counterpart. And the, what I heard back was, well, we don't talk to them. Like we don't know them. Like in a town of 7,000, we don't know them. That never used to be the case. Um, so that kind of emphasizes the point that the Atlantic piece was referring to. Right. Well, let's go to some questions. We received a question from a Sherry in Freeport, Illinois, and this is kind of the big question. How can the print media survive in the future? What what do you think? Well, I don't know that we will survive uh, in print. Per, I mean, in a print product you can hold, but I don't even worry about us surviving as an industry in some form, the delivery method is already changing. Um, but I mean, people need the news. And even though we're in a, a bad fix right now, there's no getting around that. I, you have to have faith to do this work. You, if you, <laughs> if, you know, people say, how do you sometimes ask me, how do you keep doing this when, when, you know, there's so much skepticism about the press. And I say, well, I believe this, this is a religion to me. <laughs> What else would I do with my life? I mean, I I don't I don't see the alternative. So, but I I also really do have faith that the news will always um, will always be needed, and will always um, 
God willing, be available. Deborah from Oak Park, Illinois says, what can we do to combat disinformation? So I know that you referred to that earlier. Uh, I mean, apart from individual journalists just being utterly rigorous in their work, um, I, I guess maybe more broadly, when did things turn? When did this whole, uh, this whole genre of, you know, uh, fake news, et cetera, I mean, obviously it was intensified to put it mildly during the Trump presidency, but when did it, when did it begin and what can be done? I guess this letter question is. I mean, it's been decades in the making. I mean, you know, an enemy of the people was certainly a new one for us in this country anyway, but um, I mean, it, it has been a well-funded industry to turn the public against us. Not to say we don't make mistakes. Of course, we make them all the time. But it, it didn't happen out of nowhere. It happened because uh, a lot of money was spent on making sure that it happened. So what can ordinary people do? They honestly can support their local paper. I mean, it's great to have the, uh, a subscription to the New York Times and the Washington Post, wonderful publications, and I worked both places, but please support your local paper. I mean, that means everything because um, without that, I mean, it's not just the teddy bear picnic you will not know the the what officials in your area are getting away with. And sometimes now when we inform the public about what officials are up to, they don't want to hear it. Okay, but we're going to tell you anyway. And it is important to democracy that that work go on. Uh, you got a, a question slash fan note from Susan in Prairie View, Kansas, who said, Melinda is my hero. Oh. <laughs> it's her relentless pursuit of dirty Kansas City police officer Roger Galuski. Galuski. Yeah, is cr is crucial. Right. My question: What is the status of the civil case pending, and does that affect pri does, does that private action affect or frustrate uh, the concurrent FBI investigation? So maybe if you could tell us a little bit about what the case was and where it stands. Uh, Roger Golubsky is a former Kansas City, Kansas police detective who has been credibly accused of raping dozens of mostly black, powerless Kansas City, Kansas women. Uh, the FBI uh, be itself believes that he's responsible for at least one un of their unsolved murders uh, in case after case. He, women he had been sexually involved with, and that's definitely a euphemism, uh, ended up dead. And he, then he, in some cases, investigated the murder, investigated, and not surprisingly, a lot of those cases were never solved. Um, the FBI, I mean, there is a grand jury investigation going on, but the FBI has been looking at this case on and off this and related cases on and off since the 80s. So I really have to ask, is anybody that bad at their job? I mean, you really cannot not wonder whether it's a Whitey Bulger situation where there's some corruption because there have been ties. I'm not saying that's, I, I do not know that's the case. So I can't say that it is, but of course you, you know, this has gone on and on and on. And at this point, so many women have come forward to tell their story to me and to others at great personal risk. And yet nothing has been done. So I'm very eager to say the least to see some indictments. There is a civil case involving Roger Golubsky, who was the lead investigator into a double murder for which a man named Lamont McIntyre went to prison for 23 years. He did not commit these murders. Uh, Roger Golubsky, the investigator, and the prosecutor, a woman named Tara Moorhead, absolutely had to have known at the time that he was not involved. Uh, Lamont's mother, Rosie McIntyre, uh, is one of the many who has accused Roger Golubsky of sexually assaulting her. Um, so then is it, was it a coincidence that after she refused to be part of 
uh, of this group of women who continued to be exploited by him, that he and his brothers were put in the photo lineup uh, for these murders, and that an eyewitness who knew it wasn't Roger Golubsky was was coerced into, I mean, who knew it wasn't Lamont, was coerced into saying otherwise. I mean, she was so upset at being, as she said, later told me, her name's Nico Quinn, forced to lie on some on this man and put him in prison she went home from court and tried to kill herself then she made it all right but the pressure that woman brave woman was under was terrible this situation is just so far beyond belief that if i had not reported it myself i'm not sure i would believe such a thing possible in the united states of america and it still goes on and He's still walking around free, collecting a public pension. As far as the civil case, that's going on trial and uh, going to trial in November. But that, that's not the same as what I think is needed, which is not only indictments of not just Roger Golubsky, but also those who enabled him, but a class action suit for his many victims, their many victims. When you get involved, you know, as a reporter in a case like this, I mean, it just seems like such a, you know, disturbing, immersive experience. I mean, yeah. can you compartmentalize and just <laughs> go home at the end of the day and just kind of disengage? Or is it just something Absolutely that just kind not. of gnaws at you for? I guess some people can do that. I never have been able to. But I should also say I've never been involved before in something quite this massive and upsetting. So no, there's absolutely no putting that aside and nor should you be able to. I mean, it you're upset because it's upset, it's damn upsetting, right? So thank you for that question, Susan. Let's talk about just, uh, you know, for students out here who are thinking of, of careers in journalism, um, what would you say? What is the best part of the profession? What is the, the worst part? What is the most frustrating? How, what does the ledger look to you? Oh, I think it's the most fantastic work. It's, it's very hard work in all ways. It can be physically demanding. It's definitely very emotionally demanding. I think um, only do it if you can't imagine doing something else because it's hard. But if you are that person, you're going to love it. I mean, it's all good. It really is. Because to have, it's such a privilege to be able to tell people's stories. It's such a privilege to even try to get to make a difference. Um, I feel like the luckiest person I can think of to have gotten to do this for work. Because it honestly doesn't feel like work when you love it that much. And can compare the, the experience between you know covering national politics. I mean, you, you did that obviously at a very very high level, international in Rome, versus um, you know working for a local newspaper covering these sorts of cases. I mean, and I'm not trying to face you know erect a straw man. What are the kind of competing uh, you know intrigues about both of those realms? I'm glad I had all the experiences. I had even the ones that were um, more negative because you will learn so much from those. I mean, it's a cliche, but it's also true. I, I, as I said before, though, the what I'm doing locally means a lot more to me than what I ever did nationally or internationally, because had I not been there, nothing would have been different. Nothing would have been appreciably different. And I really don't think that's the case in local news. Right. We just so, have so many more opportunities to try to make a difference. Right. Yeah. So when you arrive in Sacramento in a few days and you take up a position with the Sacramento Bee, how are you going to, um, how are you going to start? How do you, um, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to intrude with that question. So. I don't know. A friend of mine said, what's your first column going to be? I said, oh, my gosh, I don't I don't know yet. Um, so my, you know, I same 
I, my plan is to do the same as in Kansas city to start, you know, just jump in covering people, covering events, you know, being more observational than investigative in the beginning when I don't have contacts, I certainly have a lot to learn. So it's important to go in with great humility. Um, and I'm looking forward to, I know I'll be writing a lot of, or I think I'll be writing a lot about the climate crisis, you know, where that's Im impossible to ignore right now in California. And I think that that's a story that uh, the rest of the country really does need to hear about. And tell us about the Sacramento Bee. I mean, it's a, it's a newspaper I've heard about for many, many years. It's kind of a fabled company a company and newspaper. I mean, broadly in terms of its circulation, is it mostly a Sacramento or does it have, I know it covers the state capitol, does it have pretty- it's uh, mostly, It is also like the Kansas City Star local paper. It uh, has, it's our sister paper. It's one of the 30 McClatchy papers. Um, so, and I will be going to work there for the woman, Colleen Nelson, who brought me to Kansas City five years ago. She's now the executive editor of the Sacramento Bee. Great. And my husband will be working there too. Oh, good. Great. Yeah, that'll be fun. Perfect. Well, Melinda, I, I want to just say finally, when you and I, when I sent my first note to you and I identify myself as the director of the Paul Simon Public Policy Institute, you wrote back <laughs> in about two minutes, you said you had me at Paul Simon. Tell me about that. Uh, about Paul Simon and how oh, gosh. he's... I don't even think it was two minutes. I'm like, Paul Simon Institute, I'm in. Oh, I just thought Paul Simon was the one, and I still do think he was one of the greatest public servants of my lifetime. I was very disappointed he did not become president, but talk about a man who did so much good and who started as a small town newspaper guy. So great admiration for senator simon yeah and one of his real breakthroughs was writing about corruption in the illinois general yeah. assembly and uh, i think for harper's right. and uh he was uh you know started out at troy and then had 18 or 19 papers and was just a crusading a journalist and then went on after his political career was over to write it as you know of course you could tell me all about it as many books so very admirable person Great. Well, Melinda, it's been so much fun to talk to you. We have lots of cross-cutting interests and, and all, yes. so we will definitely have to, <laughs> to keep in touch. And, um, and Thank again, you, so you know, much for having me. Yeah, I mean, breaking, you know, literally on the move, uh, pulling off in, in Denver, <laughs> that, uh, that earns you induction into the Institute's Hall of Fame. I'm honored. <laughs> Thanks Thank so much. Thank you so much, John. Take well, care. Stay in touch. Thank you. Okay, Thanks. bye. Thank you for watching, and we'll have a video of this interview on our website tomorrow. Show it to family and friends and help us keep the, the memory of Paul Simon alive and well. Thanks so much.